very good evening everyone. It's good to see you this evening. We're going to ask some questions tonight, which you may have asked before. We're going to look at some things which you might not have been caused to think about uh, in the past with regards to the Bible, the book that's in front of us this evening. Because the problem is that the books of the Bible were all originally written between two and three and a half millennia ago. Two to three and a half thousand years ago. And so how can we be sure that the book that we have in front of us tonight contains an accurate reflection of what was originally written so many years ago? And can we trust what we're reading? Has it changed? How do we know someone didn't make it up just 500 years ago and write it and meant it to look as if it was older than it was? What sort of confidence can we have when we come to think about that? And really then, the main questions we're thinking about are how can we be sure that the Bible today is an accurate reflection of what was originally written? And has the text suffered loss or alteration during repeated copying down the centuries? And essentially, to break it down more simply, we're asking four big questions. First of all, what is the Bible? We'll ask some simple questions. When and how was it originally written? How has it come down to us over time? And surely the most important question to ask is what does the Bible say? What is so important that it was written down and has been kept in this way over the years? Now these are big questions. That's why I've said four big questions. There's a lot to say about each of them. And I'll start off quite simply with the answers and then depending on how interested the faces are, we can go into things uh, to a greater or lesser detail. If half of the people are asleep, then I'll quickly jump on to the next one. But it's a fascinating subject and you can go into it in great detail uh, if you desire. So first of all then, what is the Bible? Now this probably is a question we've considered before for ourselves. Now we know that the Bible is a treasure house of sacred writings collected together, which has grown in past centuries until it reached its present stature, which we see today. And we believe that it grew in the past under the favorable and directing influence of him who is the author of all things the Lord God. We read there in Paul's second letter to Timothy, if we can just mention Paul and Timothy, isolated like that just for a moment, that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young disciple Timothy in chapter 3 verse 15, from a child Timothy thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So already this is a truly unique book. There are no other books like this book. There are other books that might claim to give us wisdom of a sort, instruct us, teach us something. But this book, it claims, can make us wise unto salvation. And that's talking about salvation from the grave, from the dust from which we will all resolve into eventually can make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so already we see this book is going to be about Christ Jesus and meant to design faith in us. And verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is God breathed? God is the source. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect truly furnished unto all good works. And believers in God use the Bible as the word of God. Christadelphians have always believed this. It's the foundation of our faith that the Bible is what it claims to be, that it is the word of God. And we treat it as such. And when we make that step of faith, then we have a rock on which to stand and to base all our belief and all our practice that it is the word of God. So what, though, exactly is it, if we return to our question a, a little more simply? When we open uh, the Bible, what do we find? Now, one of the first things you notice, very <coughs> simply, when you open a Bible, is that it's divided in two unequal parts. The first part's called the Old Testament, and the second part is called the New Testament. 
Now, the word testament here we'll look at uh, in a moment. But we'll see that the basic structure of the Bible hinges, literally, on this idea that God has made two covenants, uh, two testaments with mankind, and that one has replaced the other. One is new, and it has made the other old. Now, the English word testament comes from the Latin word testamentum, which means a will. But in this particular context, it's the translation of a Greek word, a uh, Diathek, which means a covenant. And the old and the new covenants refer to those made between God in the past. The old covenant at Sinai and the new covenant inaugurated by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you think, are these the covenants then? Well, not exactly. Both of these covenants, under the direction of God, launched great spiritual movements, we might say, in the earth. And under his directing and inspiring hand, Books were written from God uh, under these uh, covenants. And so they were known as the books of the Old Covenant and the books of the New Covenant. And as with everything else over time, it got shortened until eventually people were just calling it the Old Covenant. Uh, the books of dropped out. And so the Old Testament and the New Testament. And by the end of the second century AD, that's how they were being called. Uh, Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian of Carthage tell us that. Together... They're called the Bible. Why is that? Well, it appears to have come from a man who lived uh, long ago in the 4th century called John of the Golden Mouth, John Chrysostom. He appears to be the first person to refer to both testaments together as the books, Ta Biblia. And when it came over into uh, Latin, it came over as a singular, the book, and so the Bible. That's a bit of, of information there about the words we use, which you might not think about them uh, often when we look at the Bible. But when we open it, we find that it is, in fact, a library of books. If we were to divide each and bind them and put them uh, in a bookshelf uh, like that, then we'd have different books relating to different times. And all the Old Testament books, I'll give this a try, yes, it works, are uh, on the left and the New Testament on the right. Uh, the Old Testament books, Genesis describes the creation of the universe, of the heavens and earth. And it picks up the promises God made to the fathers and the history of Israel, their history from Joshua through to Esther. There are books of poetry. There are the words of the prophets, the 12 minor prophets, and by extension, the major ones, uh, prophets sent to speak to Israel. I'd like to look a little more closely here, though, at the New Testament. The New Testament consists of 27 short Greek writings, which we call books. Some of them are only a page uh, long or less. The first five are historical in character, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And the first four are called Gospels because they relate the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. They contain sayings and doings <coughs> of Jesus in the good news that he had been sent to save mankind from their sins. And the fifth book is actually a continuation of the third, written by the same writer, Luke, which charts the history of the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem, as you're looking at it, to Rome in a westerly direction over about 30 years after the crucifixion and describes how the gospel was received uh, in the Roman Empire. And then instrumental in that, the Apostle Paul wrote letters to congregations like the Philippians, but also to individuals like Timothy, uh, as we've seen in our reading. So of the other 22 books, 21 are letters, and 13 bear the name of the Apostle Paul. Now, there are actually four books that are anonymous in the New Testament. Do you know which ones they are? We don't, it doesn't say who wrote them. Hebrews. Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews. So we don't know who wrote that, but from an early date it was bound with Paul's epistles. And so you might see at the top of your Bible a heading, the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, but we don't know who wrote it precisely. And there are three others. It's not, it's, well, it's kind of a trick question. It's actually the uh, epistles of John, because the name John doesn't appear in the text of the letters. But from an early time, they've been known as the letters of John. And so uh, we have that as a title in the English Bible. 
And the final book, The Apocalypse, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, giving a prophetic foretaste of things to come, right up to the second coming of Christ. Now we notice as well, as we look at the Bible, that it's divided into chapters and verses, and that's very convenient for us. We were all able to find the exact same place in a huge tome this evening, because our president said 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse so on. They're not original though, of course. In the 13th century, a theologian in Paris arranged the Vulgate, which is a Latin translation of the Bible, into the modern chapter divisions that we use today. And in the 16th century, Stephanus' Greek Bible introduced the system of verse numberings, which we're familiar with. And so there were other schemes, but these were the popular ones and they've come down to us. And it's for convenience, so that we might know where we're looking. And chapters and verses are helpful, of course, but the problem with chapters is that it overlooks a more significant literary uh, breakup, which is the paragraph. Uh, thoughts come in paragraphs, don't they? And if you have a modern English Bible, perhaps it also divides yours up into paragraphs. Well, that's just a little bit then about what the Bible actually is when we look at it. But this is the important question we want to get to, uh, beginning with this one. When and how was the Bible originally written? We can answer this one quite quickly, because we know that the books of the Old Testament were all written between two and a half to three and a half thousand years ago. And they were written in Hebrew. There are Aramaic sections of the Old Testament in the books of Daniel and Ezra and um, <coughs> Nehemiah and a verse in Jeremiah. But other than that, originally written in Hebrew. And we're fairly certain that they were originally written on prepared skins from references in the Talmud and from the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on. The books of the New Testament were all written in the first century AD and they were originally written on papyrus. And they would have been bound in a, a codex, which is a bound book. Uh, those were the vehicles of the word of God. Now, this is the question I want us to ask this evening. It might seem like a strange question, but with all the, the different items of interest that are involved, all the different spheres that we have to bring together this evening, I found that actually a very simple way of addressing them all and bringing them into our mind is to simply ask this hypothetical question. And that is, if this evening we wanted to produce an English Bible, so let's imagine that all the English Bibles have vanished from the earth and everything else was still here, and we wanted to produce an English Bible, how would we do it? How would it be done? Now, when we think about that question, we meet all the different issues involved in this case. Now, the answer is very simple. We need to translate the originals into English. So we just need the original books of Moses, of Isaiah and Jeremiah. We need the original Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all of Paul's original epistles. We need someone who can read and understand Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek and English and translate them into English, bind it together, and we'd have an English Bible for 2012. We just need the originals. But of course, the great problem is that we don't have the originals. They no longer exist, or if they do exist, then no one knows where they are. If someone knows where they are, then they're not telling everyone else, and they're sitting on one of the greatest treasures that could ever be found. We can't translate the originals. And I don't know about yourselves, but for me, this is the question that eventually rose in my mind. I have to say, not early on, when I came to God, but later. If what I'm holding isn't a translation of the originals, what is it a translation of? Have you ever asked that question? What are we looking at here? That's an important question, I think, and really the, uh, the reason why uh, I want to share this evening with you. What is it a translation of? In the absence of the original documents, what could we do in our predicament? Well, there are lots of things we could do. First of all, we could select a very old manuscript. And when we say manuscript in this context, we mean a copy of the originals, very ancient, but not the originals themselves, in the same language. So something that was copied you know, 200 years after the original, say, if we had such a thing. 
and we could translate that into English. Now you could do that, of course you'd have to be very certain about the one manuscript you chose, that that was a reliable one in itself to translate. And so what we do instead is look at all the manuscripts, all the manuscripts that exist of the Bible text, the Hebrew and the Greek manuscripts, the ancient ones, and look at them all and put them together so that we have a reconstructed text that we feel is close to the original. Now we've also said there uh, manuscripts and authorities. Now there are some other things that you can look at. We can look at the manuscripts themselves, for example the Codex Vaticanus, which is a very ancient Greek Bible in Rome. But we can also look at the ancient versions, because when the Bible came into other lands, it was received as the Word of God and translated into other languages like Coptic and Syrian. So we could look at those and translate those also. But we could also look at quotations. Ancient writers quoted the Bible. For example, Justin Martyr, who lived in Rome in the 2nd century AD, wrote extensively, we have his writings, and he quoted passages from the Bible. And the important thing there is, he was quoting from a manuscript, he was looking at it and quoting it, a manuscript that's older than the oldest ones we still have, if you see the point. So what was he looking at? is the question. Now obviously you have to trust that he quoted it correctly, but we're looking over the shoulder of the quotas and seeing what were they looking at when they wrote that quotation. So that's something you can do. And the whole of the Bible exists in quotations alone. So we could look at that too. So then, let's think a little about the Old Testament. Now we know with the Old Testament we have a helping hand uh, with looking at the text because from earliest times the Jewish scribes uh, devoted themselves to the accurate transmission of the books of the Bible and scribal activities passed from generation to generation and the scribes who transmitted the text are generally known as the Masoretes they go back to about 500 AD and they succeeded the earliest scribes and they're, they're so important in this work that generally the, the Hebrew Bible is known as the Masoretic text and if you see a capital MT in your study Bible that's what it means, the, the original Hebrew. So that's what we need, we need a copy of the Masoretic text. There is a, an example of how the Hebrew would look uh, as you looked at a Masoretic text. So what is the oldest version of this that we have? Well, the picture that's been in the top right of the screen the whole time is a photograph of something called the Aleppo Codex. And it's a 10th century codex, 10th century AD, so it's a thousand years old. And <laughs> I had to think of that a moment there. And it was finished sometime in the 10th century, and in 1947, uh, rioters, enraged by the UN decision to establish a Jewish state in Palestine, burned down uh, a synagogue in Aleppo where the Codex was kept, but it still exists. And it dates back to the 10th, 11th centuries. There, there's another one, the Leningrad Codex as well. And we could use that, so half of our job is done. We just need the Aleppo Codex and we could translate that into English. And there's the Aleppo Codex. But the difficulty with that is that it's old, but it's not very old. Right? The originals were written two and a half to three and a half millennia ago, and the Aleppo Codex was copied, so we understand that, the scribe copied it out from something he was looking at that's gone, in the 10th century. So we have this gap of time. How do we know that what existed there is the same as the Aleppo Codex. Now you might at this point be thinking in your mind, and you might have thought it uh, 10 minutes ago, or longer, depends how long I've been talking so far, <laughs> that I don't need to know these answers. You know, I believe that God would not let his word become corrupted or changed or added to over time. And it might be that that is your position, and that's respected, of course. And we're sure that God wouldn't allow it. But if you're not of that mindset, then what about this question? That's what we're saying this evening, trying to 
reassure the foundations of what we think. Well, here's a little simulation I've done to try and explain what this problem is, because you might not have thought about this before. If we look at the original uh, Hebrew Bible being written, being inspired by God, as Paul referred to, uh, it's in three parts, the law, the writings, the prophets, all written a long time ago, which we could summarize as the Hebrew Old Testament. What happened was copies were made of the Hebrew Old Testament. So these red bars are copies, are manuscripts that exist over time. It was translated into Greek in 280 BC, uh, and that is known as the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Now this is what happened over time. Scribes copied and copied and copied the Hebrew Bible out. Eventually, at 500 AD, the Masoretes were involved, and the Masoretic text continued to be copied. Copies were made of the versions, like the Old Greek, the Septuagint, and the Latin, and so on. And more and more and more manuscripts came into existence. That's these bars. But the predicament is, the originals are gone, wiped out, or somewhere that we don't know, and all the old manuscripts we don't have. So if we then only have a 10th century AD Masoretic text, how do we know that that is the same as the originals that were written? How do we know that it was transmitted accurately over that period? What we really need are some of these, some of the ones that were missing, some of the really early ones that were closer to the originals being written. And if those are the same as those, it gives us confidence that those are the same as these, the originals. Yep. And so we would be reassured about the situation if we needed that reassurance. And if you understand that, then you will see, if you didn't already know, why an event which occurred in 1948 was so sensational. The discovery of some ancient manuscripts found in the vicinity of the Dead Sea uh, first reported in March 1948, uh, near the caves where the scrolls were found, uh, situated on a high plateau overlooking the Dead Sea, are the ancient ruins of Qumran, which was a deeply religious sect of Jews who lived there from the 2nd century BC to the 1st century AD, eventually destroyed by the Romans. And uh, you know how the story goes that there were boys uh, throwing stones at the rocks and one of the stones disappeared and they heard a smash. It was the smashing of a scroll flask. And then boys did what boys also do. They climbed up and in and made one of the greatest discoveries that there's ever been in these uh, scrolls. In all, about 800 scrolls, including thousands of fragments, have been uncovered. And there are about 200 scrolls of the Old Testament text of every book of the Bible except <coughs> Esther. And they date 300 BC to 50 AD. Uh, there, if we get an idea of where things are, the Dead Sea, there's Qumran, where the discovery was uh, made, and there's Jerusalem, Masada, uh, to give us an idea of the geography. There's an example of one of the scrolls, the scroll of the Psalms. They all have a peculiar code to them, which tells us uh, which room they were found in, and which jar, and so on, and what the book is. And this, you know, might be a bit uh, of detail here, but just to show, these are some other sites of discovery, Masada and so on, don't worry about that so much. Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls here, these are how many scrolls were found, and this is the total. And if we go down, see, look, we've got over 200 uh, Hebrew scrolls of the Old Testament books there at uh, Qumran. Now, the Isaiah Scroll, which is kept in the Shrine of the Book in a, a special museum, the Isaiah scroll was actually carbon dated twice, once in 1990 and once again four years later. And they carbon dated it to the first uh, date when they did it in Zurich was from 230 to 248 BC. And when they did it again four years later in Tucson, it was 230 to 253 BC. And we see what the point is there, that these scrolls are over a thousand years older than the oldest scrolls we had before. And so it was an incredible uh, discovery. And the point that we glean from it this evening is that to all intent and purpose, the message, the reading of those scrolls 
bore out the Aleppo Codex. Now, it wasn't exactly the same. It wouldn't be for me to say it was in exactly the same. But I'll show you what the differences were in just a moment. They amounted to differences in style and vocabulary and so on. Nothing that changed the meaning of what was being said. And all the scrolls of the initial discovery are kept there in the shrine of the book. So the situation then now is that although we had this big time gap, the Dead Sea Scrolls shortened that by a thousand years. And so we could look at those. And the people who said, I, I didn't believe that God would let his word get changed, said, well, I thought so when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. I don't know, I wasn't alive at the time. But those who perhaps doubted the Bible could see that it had been transmitted accurately over the years. And so that's, the, that's where the manuscripts fit in. So, this evening, if we had to do it, we don't, so we shan't worry, but if we wanted to make an English Old Testament, we could look at the Aleppo Codex and all the other old manuscripts, we could look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we could look at the quotations, the Septuagint manuscripts, and from those there would be an English Old Testament. Now just uh, quickly thinking about the New Testament, I think most people are still with us, so I'll plough on and uh, talk about this in, in a bit of detail with the New Testament, because it's a little bit different the situation with the New Testament because the New Testament autographs and by that we mean the original ones written with the hand of the original writer inspired by God if they were written on papyrus then with constant use they would have perished within a decade so the original letter of Paul to Timothy might have been lost destroyed after 10 years say that's just a guess no one knows if that's exactly the case but the word of God was not hopelessly lost because these letters, the Gospels, were received with the authority of heaven. And so copies were made and manuscripts came into existence. Now it's true that the New Testament is far and away the best <coughs> attested book from the ancient world. Now what we mean by that is that there are more manuscripts of the Greek New Testament than any other ancient book. There are over 5,800 New Testament manuscripts. You might say, well, that, that figure doesn't mean anything to me. Well, if I told you that there are, of Aristotle's uh, writings, we've heard of Aristotle before from the ancient world, there are 49 manuscripts of Aristotle. There are seven manuscripts of Plato. There are over 5,800 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. It is the best attested book from the ancient world. Now, what are the oldest New Testaments we have? We have some complete New Testaments from the 4th and 5th centuries AD. And some of the oldest have long names like the Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus and the Alexandrinus. Those are 4th century uh, Bibles. Does anyone know who that is there? There's a big clue in the, uh, the codex associated with him. That's uh, Friedrich Constantin von Tischendorf. And he is a man yeah, no. of whom it was said <laughs> that he, he spent his whole life either in a library or on his way to the next library uh, in search of manuscripts, biblical manuscripts and others. And when he came to St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula, he was entertained there and was shown leaves of what it transpired was a magnificent old Greek Bible, which is known now as the Codex Sinaiticus, and by one means or other it was taken from that uh, monastery, uh, eventually presented uh, as a gift to the Russian Tsar, but eventually purchased from the Russians by the British, uh, and now resides in the British Museum in London. And there it is uh, behind the glass. They don't let you look through it, but uh, you can see it there in London. Now, the Sinaitic manuscript arrived in London the day after Boxing Day in 1933, and it was purchased from the Russians by the British for £100,000. And half of that was raised by public appeal, and the Christadelphians contributed something at the time. Now, this manuscript is now beyond price. I don't think you could purchase it. Now, can you imagine if David Cameron said, the Russians have got this ancient Bible, it's worth countless millions, we want to buy it, to put it in uh, the uh, British Library in London, uh, we want the public to contribute. 
do you think that anywhere near half the value would be forthcoming? And I think it shows us, doesn't it, of the regard with which the Bible was held just 50 or so years ago compared with now, where it is of little import in most people's lives, sadly. But at the time there was great interest in this codex, and you can go and see it in London at uh, the British Library. And it contains uh, the oldest complete manuscript of the New Testament. There's the Codex Vaticanus in the Vatican Library in Rome, which was closed when I visited, so I couldn't take a photograph of that. Probably shouldn't have taken this photograph, actually, but uh, can't show you that. And there are some others uh, dating from about the same time. Now, of course, these manuscripts are 4th century Bibles, and we don't have many complete manuscripts from before that time. And the reason for that, uh, out of interest, is that we're still feeling the effects of a persecution that was levelled against the uh, Christians in the 4th century by Diocletian, a Roman emperor. Now, he did to the Christians what hadn't really been specifically done before, which is instead of just targeting their bodies, he targeted their literature and destroyed their books. And as a result, we still don't really have any uh, fully complete manuscripts from before his reign. And um, it's su suspected that the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus are manuscripts that were put together in Constantine's reign when Christianity was made the religion of the Roman Empire. But that's why we don't have the older ones. And so we have almost a similar predicament. We have old manuscripts we could use, but they're not very old. There's a few hundred years missing there. Do we have anything that could uh, fill that void? Well, in recent years, the sands of Egypt have revealed numerous papyrus fragments and manuscripts. And currently there are 127 New Testament papyri known, and they're all called P with a number uh, to designate them. And some of these are 150 years earlier than the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts. And they're indispensable in filling the textual void that exists between those great manuscripts and the originals being written. And importantly, these papyri mainly confirm the text that's always been used in the Sinaitic and the Vatican and, and other manuscripts since. So here are some of the oldest ones. Uh, for example, uh, P104 there of Matthew 21 is in the Ashmolean Museum along with others in Oxford, which you can go and see. P1, interestingly, the first one to be discovered was from the first page of the New Testament, from Matthew chapter 1. That's amazing, wasn't it? And then they're all numbered after that. The most famous is uh, P52, the uh, John Ryland's fragment, which is there in... Uh, the John Rylands Library in Manchester and can be seen behind the glass there. Very small, but dated to 125 AD. So not all that long after it was originally written, originally copied out and, uh, by John. It's from uh, John's Gospel, John chapter 18. But they're not all this small. There are bigger ones, uh, the big six papyri. Uh, P45, P47 at the bottom are amongst the Chester Beatty manuscripts which are in Dublin, in Ireland. And that was open when I went, but I don't have photographs, I'm afraid. Now, some of those include a copy of the four Gospels and Acts, although uh, some of the leaves are missing. You know, incredible discoveries that have been made, and they all contribute to the solid base on which our text is based that we have ancient fragments, ancient manuscripts that are close to when the originals were written down, which give us witness to the same text. And so what occurred here is the gap was closed and we have now manuscripts very close to when the originals were written. Now in case you're thinking, uh, are you sweeping anything under the carpet here? Is there something that you're not telling about this uh, subject? Well here, that is not a yellow line, that's actually a bar chart. And the yellow is the Greek New Testament uh, words which are certain. You know, there's so many manuscripts that witness to those words. Uh, the uncertain text is in blue, the tiny bit there, 912 words. And when we say uncertain, what are we talking about? Well, 
if we break that blue area down, we see that 27% of those are minor variants of interest to Greek grammar only, 7% are single word variants of minor significance, 10% single word variants with minor changes to meaning, 18% phrases of several words with slight significance, and 38% of this tiny bit uh, narratives of some length, and that's exclusively in two sections of the New Testament at the end of Mark's Gospel and a particular section in John. That's it. Those are the minor variations we find in these thousands of manuscripts. But it's all witnessing to the same text, and I include that slide because uh, we want to be honest and say what uh, these manuscripts are telling us. So let's have some conclusions at this point about the Old Testament. There are many independent witnesses to the text. They all witness to the same. The majority of variants are very minor, and even the most major variants make no difference to the message and to the belief. There are 5,800 Greek manuscripts plus thousands of versions. The earliest full witness is 200 AD, and there are many manuscripts from the fourth century onwards. And there are thousands of citations. <coughs> And so, perhaps to summarise that, we could quote Sir Frederick Kenyon, and if you ever look at this subject, you'll find Frederick Kenyon mentioned quite a lot. He said that you can take the whole Bible in your hand and say without fear or hesitation that you hold in it the true word of God, handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. And that's true. Critics of the Bible don't attack on this front, because it's strong. They look for other things we can be sure that the text has been copied down the ages and is now representative of what God has always been saying to us. Out of 15,000 lines, fewer than 100 are in doubt, and two-thirds of that variation is minor. And those are the two areas I mentioned earlier. Now, I just want to talk uh, briefly to you about this, because uh, everyone's with us. And how was it done? Because, you know, to be able to do what we're doing this evening and to go to our homes and do what some of us might do later and open our Bibles and read it in our own language and not worry that someone's going to come knocking on the door and say that we can't do it or they'll take it from us when we leave this hall and burn them, that is a situation the like of which previous centuries just haven't known. You know, it's not for a long period that this privilege has been enjoyed and the battle for the common man to be able to read the Bible in his own language was actually fought and won here in England. I have to think when I'm in Wales to say over there in England. And it was John Wycliffe who had the peculiar idea that the common man was worth something. Uh, in the 14th century that was a peculiar idea and he said no man was so rude a scholar but that he might learn the words of the gospel according to his simplicity. What he's saying is that people should be able to read the Bible for themselves. I was going to say, do you know who that is? But I've written it there. The animation failed on that slide. But that is what we believe Martin Luther looked like, uh, who was a German reformer, the Great Reformation in Europe in the 16th century. And he translated the Bible into German and did much for the modern German language in the process in 1534. Uh, William Tyndale translated the Bible into modern English. Wycliffe's English was Middle English, and if you ever try reading it, you see it's different to modern English. Uh, William Tyndale, his life's passion was, if God spare my life, he said this to an opponent, I'm not sure who, I think it was Thomas More, if God spare my life here many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plough shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. And in 1525, that was quite uh, an insult to say to a learned professor. Uh, I was going to show that photograph and say, do you know who this is? And some of us might say William Tyndale. That's not William Tyndale. It's the portrait that uh, is, has been made of him that hangs, I think, in Hartford College in Oxford. But it wasn't actually made of William Tyndale. What they asked for was, uh, can you make a portrait of a stereotypical Protestant martyr and we'll have that as William Tyndale. William Tyndale would never have let himself be made an image of in his life. He spent a lot of his life uh, in exile and running from authorities who were trying to kill him and who eventually succeeded. 
he wouldn't have sat for a portrait uh, like this. It wouldn't make locating him much easier. <coughs> and so although in our, in our minds we think of William Tyndale as looking like that, he probably looked different. In fact, he almost certainly did. But William Tyndale gave his life that the Bible might be translated into English. We shan't worry about that one too much. But you don't have these Bibles on your laps tonight, do you? Uh, Coverdale's Bible, the Bishop of Exeter, uh, the Great Bible, if you've ever seen one, it's a gargantuan and they were made and put in English churches. Uh, the Geneva Bible, translated on the continent when there was a Catholic resurgence and uh, reading the Bible was outlawed. The Bishop's Bible in response to the Geneva Bible, which became so popular and is the Bible of Shakespeare. Uh, and then eventually in 1611, might have been thinking about this last year in its 400th anniversary, uh, the King James Version of 1611, and that's what, uh, what I have. I don't have a 1611 though, because the King James Version was revised over time, and I think what I have uh, here is the 1769 King James. But you might have more modern versions. You can imagine, after uh, Tischendorf discovered the Codex Sinaiticus, then all this text wanted to be looked at, and so there was the revised version in 1885. The Revised Standard Version, RSV, a new translation in 1970, the NEB. You might well have an NIV, a New International Version from 78. And then in 1982, they decided that we'll have a look at this 1769 King James again, and uh, we'll do something with that. And you had the New King James Version in 1982. And then the NRSV in 1989. Probably, I would guess, almost certainly, there is an ESV in this room uh, this evening in 2001, the English Standard Version, and less likely but possible, there's a net Bible here, the New English Translation, the first Bible whose text was made freely available on the internet, and so it's a play on words, uh, the New English Translation. And uh, we won't talk too much about philosophies of translation uh, this evening. We've looked at some big questions. We've asked, what is the Bible? And we've answered that uh, to a degree. We've looked at when and how it was originally written, all those millennia ago. And we've asked and looked at in quite some detail how the Bible has come to us down the ages. And we give grateful thanks to God that he has preserved his word so that now we can open it and read his message for ourselves. And when we open it and read it, what do we find? We find good news that God has sent his Son to save us from the grave, and that if we will believe in him and identify with him in his sacrifice, then we can be saved from our sins. What would you say is the most well-known verse in the Bible, if I asked you? John 3.16. John 3, and so perhaps we could summarise with that. For God so loved the world, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I hope that this evening, in looking at some things which perhaps we haven't thought about much before, has given us greater confidence to make that step of faith, to believe that this is the word of God, and that it contains the message of salvation, and can make us wise unto salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom it speaks of, and has given us confidence to make that further step. Thank you for your kind attention.